The rest of us are going to open up to the book of Ephesians, and Lord willing, we will finish the book of Ephesians this morning. The book of Ephesians... Oh, yeah, these things. Thank you, Daniel. The book of Ephesians is all about be who you are in Christ. The book of Ephesians begins with chapters 1 through 3 about who we are and what we have in Jesus. It's all about the blessings that are ours simply because we believe in Him. Then in chapters 4 through 6, we're told, in light of who you are, in light of all that you have, here is how believers in Jesus Christ should walk before the Lord and in this world until He comes. And now this morning, we're specifically in chapter 6, we'll be covering verses 10 through 24, where we're told, up, told to gear up spiritually. Gear up spiritually. So let's look at this. Chapter 6, beginning with verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and, and for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that you may know my affairs and how I am doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and a faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts." Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. And the body of Christ said, Amen. Amen. So this morning we're talking about gearing up spiritually. Rigging ourselves up, gearing up spiritually. Now in the New Testament, including here in this letter to the Ephesians, God calls all who believe in him saints. You are a saint, a set-apart one. Hagios is the Greek word, set apart from the world unto the Lord for a purpose. You have a purpose. God has a purpose for your life. You are called a saint. You may call me Saint John from now on. No, please don't. But as saints... God has called us to the highest standards of holy living. In chapters 5 through 6, which we've gone through the last couple of weeks, we were told to walk in love, to walk in light, to redeem the time because the days are evil. We all know that's true, right? Also, that, that the wives are to submit to their husbands and husbands are to love their wives. Children are to be obedient to the Lord and let the parents say amen. The fathers are to be nurturing and yet firm, disciplining with a tender touch. Also, that those who are employees should be the best employees on the planet. And employers should be the best employers on the planet. For saints are the best of the best of the best of all things. That's what we are. We're saints. And we are to live accordingly. But, in light of the days in which we live, the evil that is so prevalent and so available even to those in the body of Christ, how in the world 
Can we live up to such high saintly standards? How are we going to do it? Well, that's what this next section of Scripture is all about. It's about gearing up spiritually that we might fight and win. Not just fight, but win. More than conquerors through him who loves us. And so in verses 10 through 20, we're told to put on the armor of God prayerfully. Put on the armor of God prayerfully. Verse 10, finally, my brethren. So he's, he's now before the closing comments there at the end of this chapter. Now he's beginning the last part of the teaching section. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There's 12 words there that are so important. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You and I, we need to memorize these words. We need to memorize Ephesians 6 verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Let's say that together, shall we? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Let's do that again. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Why do we need to memorize these words? Because we forget. Especially when conflicts occur. The moment we get into an argument, the moment that letter comes in the mail, the moment our boss says, I need to see you in my office, the moment trials and tribulations come our way, the natural tendency is to think fleshly. Think carnally. My issue is with him or her or them or this letter or my job or the church. My issue is earthly. And that's the way that we all seem to default. But we need to remember to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might because with every earthly conflict we see, there is a heavenly battle taking place that we don't see. How it goes there affects what happens here. And so if we are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, that means we have got to bring the battle up into the spiritual realm because if we fight and win there, then these things will work out here. And so we need to memorize this verse because when, again, conflict happens and the blood pressure rises and, you know, it's easy to just forget that it's a spiritual battle. So So quickly do we forget. And then Satan has us where he wants us, in the realm of the flesh. And that's why so often we lose, why we fail, because it's still on the level of the flesh. So we need to be strong in the Lord. Strong in the Lord. You know, the world talks about strength from within. You know, I looked deep within. I just manned up. I did this. I did that. No, I don't want to be strong from within. I want strength from above. You know, as saints, we have a choice. We can choose where to get our strength from, either from within or from above. Which is stronger, by the way? Above. Remember, when God said, let there be light, light sprung into existence. And from nothing, God created everything by his word. Gang, that's power. My words, not so much. I have a hard time getting the kids take the trash out with my words, let alone creating something from nothing. To be strong in the Lord is available to us at all times. Therefore, we need to remember and memorize these words. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Then in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Wow, God has weapons for us. He has armament for us. It's like he has given every saint his or her own closet full of armor and weapons. Armor and weapons that if we put on, we will fight in the heavenly heavenly realm and we will win. But we can leave it in the closet, can't we? I mean, I've got a closet full of clothes that I need to toss so many of them out. They were cool during the 80s, but now, you know, they're a little worn out and they're a little old looking. They need to go. And there's stuff in there that I haven't put on. It does me no good if it just sits there hanging on the hanger. Or, in my case, lying on the floor, you know. Those clothes don't do me any good. And God has given to us spiritual armor and spiritual weapons. But if it stays in our spiritual closet and we don't put it on, not going to do us any good. 
So we're to put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles, the trickery of the devil. You and I, we are so vulnerable to the schemes of Satan. You know, he doesn't show up in long red underwear with a tail and a, and a pitchfork say, hey, I'm the devil, I'm going to ruin your life. You good? You want to be involved in that? You know, he doesn't do that. He's a little more subtle than that. And so often he's able to deceive us, mainly by getting us to think along the realms of the flesh. My battle is with him or her or them or this letter or whatever it might be, this Facebook post. Oh no, now I got to respond back in the flesh. That's where Satan has us. He's crafty, keeps us in the realm of the flesh, thinking that our battle is with him or with her. That's why we have got to put on the whole armor of God because it's a spiritual battle, gang. It's not a fleshly battle. It's spiritual warfare, not earthly. That's why we got to gear up so that we can stand against these things. Verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Really? But that person that's yelling at me, they're flesh and blood. Yes, but remember, behind that yelling match, up in heaven there is a spiritual battle taking place between God's angels and all the different rankings and the the devil's demons and all of his different rankings. And they're fighting it out. They're duking it out. And if I don't engage up there, then I'm going to lose down here. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers and their generals and captains and lieutenants and corporals and sergeants and and privates. I know I messed up the order. Deal with it, you military people. And God bless you for serving our country. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against these principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Oh, how dark it is. Last Sunday, as you know, in Texas, a gunman rushed in, a, a, a professed atheist, and an angry, bitter, mentally disturbed young man, and he shot up the church, and 26 people died, several more injured. And then the week before, of course, in, in uh, New York City, some maniac rented a, a pickup truck and drove down a bicycle lane, killing several pedestrians and injuring many more. Just the days that we're living, living in. Shootings, random shootings, the Las Vegas massacre. Do you think it's over? Do you think these things are not going to happen anymore? Well, that was then. Well, this is not. no, no, no. It's going to happen again. But see, if we operate on the realm of the flesh and, oh, it's gun control, that's the answer. Really? No, no, no. The answer is there's a spiritual battle taking place. It's in the heavenly realm. And the body of Christ needs to band together and gear up spiritually and begin to fight these battles if we're going to see any change. But if we don't, then it's just going to get worse. It'll get worse. Remember the Columbine shooting? Remember years ago when in Colorado and Columbine, the, the one kid who was, you know, his story was he was picked on and whatever and alienated, so he felt justified going in with lots of weapons and shooting a bunch of kids? I remember I was asked by the local news media to go and, uh, and kind of say some words at a candlelight vigil down at Shelby Farms. And the reason they asked me was because no one else was in their office at the time. So they're going through the phone book, I'm sure, and, oh, Calvary, we'll call him. So I went, and I felt led of the Lord in the prayer time to say, Lord, it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And you know what? It has. And I will say it again. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. There are rulers of the darkness of this age. The devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And his strength is way more powerful than yours and mine. Unless we gear up spiritually and learn how to fight in the spiritual realm. Therefore, verse 13, take up the whole armor of God. Take it all up. Every single piece that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. How are we going to stand? We've got to take it all up. Now, if I remain on the level of the flesh, if I rely on my intellect, my arguing skills, my strength, my charm and good looks, if that's what I'm relying on, I'm I'm dead in the water already, aren't I? I've already lost. But if I fight in the realm of the spirit, 
using the spiritual armor and the weaponry that God has made available to us. And we're going to win. Now in the next section, we're going to see how the Holy Spirit through Paul compares our spiritual armor that's available to us with the armor of a Roman soldier during the days of Paul. He looked at a Roman soldier and said, okay, he wears this, he wears that, you know. And the Spirit was speaking to him, saying, you know, as you see these pieces, even so there are heavenly spiritual pieces that we can arm ourselves with. Verse 14 says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. So we have here the, a picture of the typical uh, armor of the Roman soldier and the weapons and all. And the first one on the spiritual Uh, armor list is the belt of truth. Not a physical belt that has the word truth on it, even though that would be cool. I'd like to get a belt one day that just says truth on it. That would be kind of cool. But the Roman soldier's belt kept his sword and the other weapons in place, and even his breastplate kept that in place. That belt was very important. Without it, things would jingle and flop all over the place. The belt kept things in their place and ready access at all times. That's what the truth does for us. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus was praying for the disciples, he was praying to his heavenly Father and talking about the Word, the Word of God, and he said, your Word is truth. It is the truth, and everything that contradicts the Bible is a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. It may be, oh, you know, coated in sugar and molasses and sweetness, and it might have a beautiful bow on it. Oh, this wonderful thing. Don't you feel good about this truth that the world is saying? And the world says, there is no absolute truth. Doesn't that sound intelligent? Doesn't that sound very intellectual? There's no absolute truth. Wow, really? Are you absolutely sure? there's no absolute truth. How can you be absolutely sure there's no absolute truth? Doesn't make sense. But we know the truth. Because we know Jesus. And the more we get into the Word of God, the more truth we will have in our heart, and it'll hold our things together, hold us together, keep our weapons ready in place, ready to go at a moment's notice. You know, Satan is always challenging the Bible. Back in the Garden of Eden, He said to Eve, has God indeed said? He's trying to put doubt in Eve's heart. And that's what gave way to the great fall of which we are paying the price for even to this day. When Jesus told Pontius Pilate, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So if you you are truly a person of the truth, you're going to listen to Jesus. You're going to agree with him. But then Pilate flippantly said, what is truth? which is the popular mindset of the world today. At that point, ironically, Pilate turned to the crowd and said, I find no fault in him. And then because he was so confused about this issue of truth, he then ordered that Jesus be executed on the cross. How's that for truth? What is truth? I find no fault in him. Oh, crucify him anyway. Sounds confusing, doesn't it? But that's the person. That's what happens when somebody is not of the truth. They go ahead and just do what they feel like doing right at the moment because it's truth for them at the time. No, no, no. There is absolute truth. And he sits as King of kings and Lord of lords and everyone will stand before him one day and give an account of themselves everything they've said, everything they've done, and every thought they've thunk. All before him on judgment day. We're to put on the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Gird yourself with truth. Get into the Bible. Get the Bible in you. Also, verse 14, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, this this breastplate was designed to protect the soldier's vital organs, the heart, lungs, etc. It's a breastplate of righteousness. Be righteous. Because unrighteousness exposes a person to lethal satanic attacks. But righteous, righteousness, doing what's right, keeps us alive and in the fight. So instead of asking God, how much can I get away with? How much can I fudge? What concessions can I compromise? Instead of asking those questions, how far can I go before I'm in error? Why don't we ask ourselves, 
How righteous can I be to be most honoring to God? I don't want to get close to the edge. I want to get as far away from the edge as I can. How righteous can I be before God? Breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, having shod your feet or put on your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So just like a soldier would put on those sandals that had studs on them, kind of like football or baseball cleats or soccer cleats, if that's what you played, which helped the soldier keep his ground and engage there in the fight. Even so, we are to prepare ourselves with the gospel of peace. In the Old Testament, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, who preach glad tidings. The gospel that we speak are like studs on, on, on cleats on the sandals that help us to keep our ground. The more we tell the gospel, the more we are prepared to preach the gospel, the more we will stand our ground and not be easily pushed back. Question, when was the last time you sat down with somebody and said, I need to tell you about Jesus. I want to tell you what the Bible says about being saved. That's our homework assignment for this week. Find a sinner, share the gospel. People have asked, what's the outreach program of this church? Here it is. You ready? Find a sinner, preach the gospel. Reach out. That's our outreach program. Now, if you want a, a flyer that says, you know, outreach program, I'll be happy to make one for you. But really, that's not necessary. The Bible says, Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We need to prepare ourselves. We need to know the Bible enough to be able to show them all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but Jesus came to die on the cross to pay for our sins. And if you believe in him, you will not perish but have everlasting life. And then we, like a good salesman, need to close the deal. Would you like to at this time ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life? and to be able to lead them in a simple prayer. This is not just the pastor's job. This is everybody's job. Everyone sitting here who has asked Jesus to be the Lord of their life, if you're a saint, again, saints are called to the highest level of holy living. And that means we preach the gospel. That means we actively prepare. Again, as it says there, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You want to stand your ground? Do I want to stand my ground? If I do, then I need to know how to share the gospel and I need to be out there doing it. And just by virtue of that, I will be standing my ground much more. And then finally in verse 16 it says, and above all, that means this is really important. It's above the others. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, the shield, it's an effective piece of armor that protects the soldier from slings and arrows, fiery darts, even from spears and swords. The enemy of our souls, the devil, is constantly firing faith-destroying darts at us all the time. Things like, oh, God isn't real. You know, you're praying to whom? There's nobody listening. Or the Bible really isn't the word of God. It's just another book, another religious book, just like all the others. Or, hey, you can't trust God. I mean, he's, he's, he, look how he's let you down so far. Or, you know what? Here's one that I'm constantly hearing. God doesn't love you because you've sinned too much. You've sinned too much. God's done with you. Might as well hang it up. Give it up. Faith quenches the fiery darts of the wicked one. It was the soldier's advantage to carry the biggest shield he could. Now imagine if he went into battle and he had, you know, like a, a little shield like this. I mean, you've got to be quick on the, on the draw to be able to, you know, block those things. But if you, you know, you had this huge thing you could hide behind, I mean, that was to your advantage. The biggest shield you can carry, even so, you know, it's possible for us to increase our faith. Our faith, maybe, maybe it's little. It could be much bigger. 
each one of us. We read in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. By virtue of you being here this morning, listening to the scriptures being read, God is increasing your faith. How many of you, like me, I, you know, as I'm, I'm teaching, I'm kind of, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, I'm teaching myself, I'm kind of getting pumped up. I'm thinking, yeah, I want to get in this battle. I don't want to be on the edge. I want to be right over there in righteousness. I want to, you know, gear up and get at it, you know. Who, is there a sinner out here? I need to preach to them. You know, anybody else getting excited or just me? Just me. Okay, moving on. We increase our faith, though. Maybe our faith is small. Maybe if I'm saying, you know, it's your job to go out and tell somebody about Jesus, maybe that's scaring you to death. I mean, tomorrow morning at work, you're going to find somebody at your job and you, somebody you know isn't a believer, and you say, hey, can I talk to you at lunch? I mean, don't preach at work because you're supposed to be working. But at lunchtime, it's your time. Ask them. Now, if, as I'm saying this, how many of you are starting to break out into cold sweat? I don't know what to say. I, what, I, I'm not doing that. That's confrontation. And Can't I just be loving? Can't I just be nice and they'll get saved that way? You know, truth be told, there's a lot of nice people in the world. So what differentiates us from them? The fact that we believe in Jesus. And we know that he is the one who has come to save and seek and save that which is lost. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we have Jesus. That's what makes us different. And so some of us, or maybe we're getting scared. Share my faith? You kidding me? Never done that before. What do I say? How do I begin? I don't have faith to do that. You can increase your faith by studying the Bible, by listening to even other Bible studies. There are some great ministers out there that have these wonderful websites, and you can go to them and, and download podcasts or even listen to them live streaming. And, and we even have our, all of our Bible studies from Genesis through Revelation on our website as well. You can listen to those if you wish. There's nothing greater than just sitting down with the Bible and opening it up and saying, God, this is your word. This is what you want me to know. So please open my eyes to see you and to see what you have for me. And the more we do that, the more our faith will increase. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Our shield of faith will grow and grow and grow the more we get into God's word. And then we'll be looking for opportunities to tell others about Jesus. And then in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. Now, as you know, a soldier's helmet obviously protected his head and his mind, his mind, his brain. Even so, we need to always be mindful of our salvation. The helmet of salvation. It acts as protection against the lies of of the enemy. The devil will say to us, how do you know that you're saved? I mean, look at what a big sinner you are. And we can say, well, yes, I have sinned, but my mind is protected by the spiritual truth that I'm saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not of works, but by God's grace through faith in him. And then verse 17, all of these things up to this point are defensive weaponry. Now we come to the offensive weaponry. And the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. The sword is the offensive weapon of the soldier. It's designed to cut and kill the enemy. Designed to cut and kill the enemy. We do not defeat the devil with our words. We defeat the devil with God's Word. Just as Jesus did when Satan was tempting him in the wilderness. You know, turn these stones to bread. You're hungry. Jesus said what? It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Satan said, jump off the pinnacle of the temple. You'll make a great splash. It'll be a huge, wonderful thing. And Jesus said, it is written. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Put him to a foolish test. And then he, Satan said, bow down to me. All these kingdoms are mine. I'll give them to whomever I wish. We wonder why the world's a mess. It's no secret. The kingdoms of the world belong to Satan. And he's controlling it all. 
And he said, I'll give them to him whoever I wish. I'll give them to you if you want. You don't have to go to the cross. You can take a shortcut. Why suffer? All you need to do is bow down and worship me. Jesus said, away with you, Satan. It is written, you shall worship the Lord and him only shall you serve. How did Jesus deal with the devil? He didn't say, oh, you punk, you evil whatever. I rebuke you in my name. You know, he didn't do that. He quoted the word of God. And if Jesus, who is eternal God and in a point of time became, took on human flesh, if he did that, how much more do you and I need to do that? Quoting the word of God, the sword of the spirit. By the way, we don't need to defend our swords either. We don't need to, to go about defending the Bible, why we feel it's the Word of God. No, no, no. We need to simply pull it out and use it and hack in pieces all the lies of the enemy. Don't be backed into a corner and trying to defend the Bible. Pull it out. Quote the verses. It's the sharp two-edged sword. And then another offensive weapon, sometimes overlooked in this passage, verse 18, praying always. You know, even now as I'm reading these words and, and teaching, I'm praying in my heart. Lord, please help me to communicate your word and not just the words, but also your heart. I pray that we would all hear the Lord's heart. I'm praying this in my mind. I'm also praying, Holy Spirit, Help me in able to communicate your word. And in all that we do, a little conflict at home, we need to, to be praying in our hearts. Lord, help me to be the loving husband you want me to be. Help me to be the gentle and, and nurturing father you want me to be. We need to constantly be praying. Help me to be the best employee I can be. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. You know, prayer... It's like a vehicle. It is the vehicle that transports us into the heavenly realm where the battles are fought and won. Prayer gets us up there. Prayer allows us to put on the armor of God. Prayer allows us to defeat the enemy with the sword of the Spirit. You know, there's much that the Bible does say about prayer. Oh, we could spend months and years on the topic of prayer, but I want to boil it down to this. We all need to pray more, right? We talk about prayer all day long, but really, don't we all just need to pray more? I know I do. And then verse 18, so we're praying always and then also being watchful. Not just being ignorant, but being watchful to this end. What are we watching for? To this end, with all perseverance, hang in there, saint, the Lord's coming, He's either going to come for us all together in the rapture. He's going to come and pick us off one at a time. He's coming, though. He's coming. Be watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So praying for ourselves, yes, but getting our vision beyond just ourselves unto all the world and all the believers around here. Every Sunday morning when I come uh, from my house, I pass by three churches, and then I make a left-hand turn, but there's another one just down the road. I've been in the habit for years now praying for each one of those pastors in each one of the congregations on Sunday morning. Because I realize the kingdom of God is much bigger than Calvary Chapel. Much, and certainly much bigger than Calvary Chapel Bartlett. We're just one little tiny piece, one little tiny part of the huge body of Christ. And so I pray for the, the church of Christ, Lord, may they be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And you know what? I pray the same for Calvary Chapel Bartlett. Pray for the Assemblies of God Church. Lord, help them to hear your voice, to be people of your word, and may we be people of your word as well. And Faith Baptist Church, pray for them. Lord, continue to bless them, and would you please bless Calvary Chapel Bartlett. Pray for Pastor Chewy, who at 1 o'clock in the Spanish ministry here in this building, Lord, would you please minister to this group of people, to this generation that really feels like they're on the outside. But Lord, Bring them in. Bring them into your kingdom. And would you do the same for us here at Calvary Chapel Bartlett? Praying with supplication for all the saints. Now in verse 13, again, we're told to put these things on. Don't just keep them in the closet. Make them your own. Wear them. Put them on spiritually. If we do, 
Then we'll be equipped to overcome the enemy. And then Paul's saying, pray for all the saints. But then he says, you know what? And would you pray for me too? Verse 19. And for me, that utterance, that God would open my mouth. Utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. By the way, where was Paul at this time when he was penning these words? Who remembers? He was in jail. Where specifically? In Rome. Who was he about ready to go and give a testimony before? Caesar Nero. So he's asking for boldness because he knew he he was going to speak to the ruler of the world in just a little while. Who knows who we're going to be speaking to in the near future? The ruler of the world? Maybe not. Maybe our next door neighbor. Maybe them. A co-worker. So as Paul was asking for prayer, I think we should ask for prayer too. God help me to open my mouth with boldness and tell whoever you bring across my path the truth, that you are the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through you. Verse 19, he he says, For which, you know, uh, the gospel, because of the gospel's sake, I am an ambassador, that sounds good, in chains. Oh, not good. I'm an ambassador in chains. That would be a great name for a band, wouldn't it? Ambassador in chains. And and Paul realized that, as he says several times in Ephesians, he's not a prisoner of Rome, he's a prisoner of Christ. Oh, the jail might say, you know, Roman prison. But Paul knew that he was just preaching the gospel. He was doing the right thing, and he wound up in prison. Therefore, it was the Lord who put him there for a purpose. I'm glad he did. Because now we're able to read the book of Ephesians and Philippians and other of the prison epistles. Because that's where the Holy Spirit gave these words to Paul in that Roman prison. I'm an ambassador in chains that I may speak speak boldly as I ought to speak. You know, during his imprisonment, many people were saved, including, as we read in Philippians, many in Caesar's household. Philippians 4.22, all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. Now, Caesar Nero didn't get saved. In fact, history teaches us that up until the day that Paul preached the gospel to Caesar Nero, that Caesar Nero was a pretty decent emperor. He wasn't a bad emperor. But no doubt Paul laid on him such a heavy testimony. Kind of like, this is your choice. It's do or die. Here, do it now. Ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And Nero said no. Oh, when you say no to the Lord, who are you saying yes to? Yeah. And so Paul was released, but then Caesar Nero snapped. Many Bible scholars and even little old me believes that Nero became demon-possessed. And that's why he launched such an intense persecution against Christians. Nero wanted to expand Rome, and he realized that several buildings needed to come down in order to do so, and he was getting resistance from the Senate. So Nero himself burnt the city of Rome, but then blamed it on the Christians. And more intense persecution arose because people believed him. After a couple few years of Paul being released and Nero going mad, Paul was rearrested, brought back, and was then beheaded for his faith because he trusted in Jesus. He's asking for boldness. But isn't it cool how many of Caesar's household got saved? Isn't that kind of neat? You know, maybe he didn't get Caesar, but maybe he got his wife or his kids. Or others. And the Lord was able to save them. It's exciting. We'll find out one day who got saved in Caesar's household. Paul knew that while in prison that first time, and certainly the second time, it could be the end for him. But he didn't care. Pray that I would be even more bold in my chains. Why? Why would Paul want to be more bold knowing that it could result in his death? Because he knew in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he realized that beheading was simply a one-way ticket home to heaven. 
You can't stop a person like that. A person who says to live as Christ and to die is gain. Heavenly minded people are impossible to stop. Now here in verses 21 through 24, we finally come to the Paul's salutation and closing. Here he's going to wrap up this letter. But that you may also know my affairs and how I am doing, all, all the stuff that was going on, to Caicus, wonderful name, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will make all things known to you, uh, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Tychicus was the one. He was there with Paul in Rome. Paul penned this letter, gave it to Tychicus, and said, now go down to Ephesus or go over to Ephesus and deliver this letter to them and update them on my issues here in Rome. Verse 23. Peace to the brethren. Oh, isn't it nice to not have drama? To just be at peace? This is the goal of the Christian church. Everybody love one another and like one another. Simple, right? Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. I like that. Love him in sincerity, not hypocritically, but sincerely. What did Jesus say? If you love me, do what? If you love me, somebody say it, keep my commandments. And his commandments were not burdensome. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what he told us to do. So grace getting what we don't deserve on all of us, all of those who sincerely love Jesus. Well, that raises a question. Do you sincerely love Jesus? It doesn't matter what you did as a child, any religious act you did. That doesn't matter. What matters is today, do you love Jesus? Can you want to say, oh, I love the Lord. I'm just so blessed that he called me out of the world and has saved me and all I did was believe in him? Can you honestly say you love Jesus? If there's any doubt, let's take care of that doubt this morning. After the closing song, you just come forward. There will be people up front here who would love to just lead you in a simple prayer of asking Jesus to be the Lord of your life. See, it's all about him. Jesus is like the hub from which all the spokes of humanity emanate from and will emanate to. See, it's all about Jesus. And on on, on that day when you die, when I die, when everybody dies, or again, I mentioned the rapture, if that should happen, one day every individual is going to come down his or her spoke to the center, to the hub, to Jesus. It's all about him. If it's all about him now, and you love the Lord in sincerity, you're going to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, Enter into the joy of your Lord. No more wonderful words that we will ever hear. But if it's not all about Jesus now, then what's it about? What do you got going on that's better than him? What what are you centered upon? What, What is it that the axis of your life revolves around? Is it worth it? Is it eternal? Is it true? If it's not Jesus, it's not. And so you've got to ask it, why am I revolving around this? Why is it around this relationship that I have? Why is it around drugs or alcohol or sex or money? Why is it money? Why is it intellectual pursuits that have nothing to do with the things of God? Why am I revolving around this? Well, if you want to get off that revolving, go nowhere except for you nowhere, and you want to come to faith in Jesus... You want to center upon him, make it all about him now, then it will be all about him forever. And you're going to be glad you did. So just like Paul, no doubt, tried to lay a heavy testimony on Nero, even so, with all that I can, I would like to say, look, it's heaven or hell. It's Jesus or destruction. It's the Lord or Satan. You and I, we've all been born children of the devil. We're already in his family. But do you want to keep being in his family? The one who's come to steal, kill, and destroy? Or do you want to be adopted into Jesus' family? 
It doesn't matter who you are or what you are, what you've done up to this point. None of that matters. God takes us as we are, and then he begins the wonderful work of transforming us into his image. But he takes you where you are. And if you're willing to be taken where you are, he's willing to take you. It's up to you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word and you make it so simple. Whoever loves you in sincerity, they're in. Whoever doesn't is out. Lord, we pray for any here today that that are on the outside looking in. And we pray, God, that you would please just speak to their hearts and that you would drive them to you and that you'd be convicting them of their sin and, and showing them that you are the only way and that they would repent and get right with you. Lord, may they do that today. And Lord, for we who are already saved but yet so often struggle in the flesh, God, I pray that you would help us to remember to be strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. Every moment of every day, every opportunity, reminding ourselves, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil in the evil day having done all to stand. Lord, would you help us to remember that and to live it out. Lord, increase our faith. Help us to be more in your word. May we pray more. I pray that tonight, beginning tonight at 6.30, we would begin this wonderful time of just seeking after you for the sole purpose of seeking after you. And then tomorrow night at 7 and through Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, also, Lord, just seeking your face just to be with you and for you to be with us. God, that's what we're looking for. And whatever you want to do beyond that, Lord, wonderful. But we're going to come to you. And Lord, you say if we, if we seek, we will find. We search you with all of our hearts. And so Lord, may your will be done. Right now, Lord, as, as maybe some here are, are thinking, well, do I? Do I give over my life? Do I trust in you? Or even those who think they have a pretty good life, and maybe they do so comparatively speaking. But if we don't have eternal life, it doesn't matter what good we have on this side. And so, Father, just break through all the things that the enemy is trying to say, all the lies that he's trying to put in our minds right now. Lord, do do a work among us. Show yourself. Reveal your power and your glory. Save souls. Change lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.